out of the way here. So good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, um, I'm in the UK. Good morning to those in North America and good evening to those others around the um, around the world. For the next um, about uh, 40 minutes, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about the oxides that uh, the grow on the inside surfaces of HRSG superheater and reheater tubing. Talk a little bit about how they grow and exfoliate. And uh, as many of you will know, these, these oxides in, in uh, generating plants worldwide can cause different types of, da of damage. And I'll try and identify those for you. Uh, Bob and I wanted to uh, present this uh, to the HF here. Um, and uh, earlier versions, um, as you can see, were presented at the European Forum and uh, the um, Australasian Boiler and HRSG uh, Forum, that, that, uh, sure. which Bob and I uh, run and, and organize. So the no. uh, outline of the, um, the outline of the topics are um, given here. I'm going to try and include uh, these. Um, introduction to some of the problems emanating directly from, we call it OGI, oxide growth and exfoliation, since about the 1960s. Uh, introduction to the oxides that grow in steam uh, and the generation of stresses which lead to the exfoliation, which is the main reason that the oxides exfoliate. The unique uh, classification and, and indices that have been developed for oxide growth and exfoliation on both ferritic and austenitic alloys. Um, and this is called the OGI uh, index. We'll concentrate on the ferritic side because there's not, there's not too many HRSGs that have austenitic alloys. Uh, we'll talk about a brief mention of the cycle chemistry, uh, including the application of uh, film forming substances. Um, and this comes directly from the film forming substance uh, international conference that, uh, that, that I ran uh, for uh, IAPS um, in uh, in March, and then we'll show how the how this uh, enormous database and the indices uh, can be used to identify deposits, um, erosion, and other damage mechanisms around the cycle. Um, so so this um, first slide just is a compilation of of the types of um, damage. That have uh, that that have been uh, seen in plants around the world. You can see over, over here um, what we call short-term overheating in superheaters, the same as this one over on the left-hand side. Uh, you can see the sort of oxide uh, exfoliation that causes blockage in uh, tubes uh, right here. You can see the surface of some of these tubes that have serious exfoliation, and in the in lower middle. Um, is an example of where that oxide has got uh, too uh, thick and has caused uh, long-term uh, overheating. And then over here on the lower right, you can see an example of solid particle erosion that occurs in the first stages of the LP, uh, of the HP and the IP steam, steam turbines, steam turbines. And, um, Oxide uh, growth and exfoliation also causes extensive uh, valve erosion, uh, blockage and sticking uh, due, due, due to, again, this sort of exfoliation that, that you can see in the lower right. Um, there's also uh, some um, examples of performance losses in steam turbines. And you can see um, here, uh, example of uh, IP uh, turbine uh, with some deposits that caused that caused some performance loss, and I'll come back to that at the end to explain how we can identify exactly what's uh, causing uh, or what usually causes that damage. So first, um, first I wanted to just um, talk about uh, the environments, the materials and the environment that we're talking about here, just to orient us. So these are the ferritic materials that um, uh, that we're interested in. These are both in fossil and combined cycle plants, these are ferritic alloys from uh, T11 up to uh, T91. 
And then the austenitic materials, which of course are mainly in fossil plants, as I already mentioned, not very many of them in, in uh, combined cycle plants. These are the austenitic materials, 300 series, uh, uh, fine grained alloys, and also a shot peened. I'll mention, I'll mention these just a little bit. The environments that we're uh, interested in, um, in, in are provided here, just in brief, talking about saturated and superheated steam. Um, this steam can contain um, high, uh, high uh, up to high levels of oxygen, up to 400 ppb or even, or even higher. Um, the gas turbine exhaust gas temperature for, I just put a couple of examples in here for FA and HA and HA, H machines. This is approximately what we're, we're talk, talking about. There's duct burners and tube temperatures range up to 650. 650 would be in fossil plants. We usually see temp we can see temperatures in HPCs up to up to approximately six uh, 600. Or um, so th so these are the environments. It's um, it's important to note that we're talking about. Uh, Three uh, uh, oxides, steam grown oxides here, uh, magnetite, uh, iron chrome spinel, and uh, hematite. And these oxides are, are, are what we referred to as uh, semiconductors, and uh, they grow by uh, increasing thickness by a counterflux uh, ionic diffusion process where the, where the iron ions here move from the tube material uh, or the material to the outside interface and the O2 minus ions or the oxide ion moves uh, inwards and grows oxide at, uh, on, 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 the metal, on the metal surface. I'm going to see a couple of boxes like this at the bottom. Uh, this is where the uh, latest information is provided. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, uh, acquire uh, these papers, uh, Bob uh, has them on the um, on the HF on the HF website. So I want to start here just talking about uh, some of the basic properties of the oxides uh, and particularly the coefficients of thermal expansion uh, because these because this is the property that actually uh, results and causes the oxide to exfoliate uh, the oxides to exfoliate and so. You'll see uh, here two, uh, two compilations of uh, thermal expansion coefficients, one from some years ago and uh, one from a most uh, a recent uh, paper. And, uh, and you'll see down the side here the different materials, the two ferritic materials, just as examples of T22 and T91, uh, the austenitic um, alloys that I, that I just showed you, and then the two oxides of importance, the magnetite and uh, and the hematite, and it's um, it's interesting to note here that the uh, coefficients of expansion for the 300 series um, are the are the highest uh, of 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 the other of the ferritic alloys and higher than the oxides, um, and it's interesting uh, to note that the magnetite here uh, the coefficients of expansion for magnetite are very close to the ferritic alloys, where, whereas there's a large difference between uh, a hematite here and say the other and uh, the the material the, uh, the materials here, particularly um, with relation to the uh, the austenitic alloys. And and you'll see that this is important because it essentially means that the more hematite there is in the scale, the greater will be the propensity to have have uh, exfoliation. You can take this table and you can work out the cooling strains for oxides. Say they were sitting at, at uh, 600 degrees uh, during operation. These are for the ferritic alloys. These are for the austenitic al alloys. And then across here, you'll see I've put in two examples, uh, one with essentially uh, no hematite in the alloy and one with just for the sake of this table, about 20% uh, hematite. You'll notice that uh, the oxides that grow on ferritic materials, um, grow, uh, 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 when they're cooled from 600 degrees, will go into uh, will will generate a tensile stress, and uh, those are austenitic alloys 
will generate a compressive stress. And we term these negative and positive here, as, uh, as you can see. And, uh, and and again, this is important as you'll as you'll note because we'll mention as we go through about the effect of uh, of hematite here. More hematite, uh, more hematite for austenitic alloy increases that compressive stress, whereas more hematite for the ferritic alloys decreases the tensile decreases the tensile stress. So uh, this was a very famous. Uh, a diagram that was produced a long time ago by Armit, um, who worked at uh, CERL in uh, in the CGB in England, where where I used to work in the oxide group, and uh, and this is a plot which just takes that uh, information and and gives you an indication of what the to total elastic strain is here on the vertical axis and uh, the scale thickness in the uh, on the horizontal axis, and that and as you've just seen. The, uh, the positive uh, strains relate to uh, the austenitic alloys. So the top half of this diagram is uh, for austenitic alloys. And if, and if the data comes above this line, you'll have exfoliation. Whereas in the bottom half here, you'll see that the, the strains are, are negative and uh, tensile. And, uh, and, and, uh, and if the data comes below this green line, then you would expect exfoliation to take place. As you'll see in a few minutes, there's, there's a complication with regards to laminations of the oxide. But uh, some years ago, in the early 2000s, uh, Steve Patterson and I plotted uh, plotted hundreds of sets of data from austenitic materials and from ferritic materials in these balloons, just to conf just to confirm and validate the importance of the uh, strains resulting in exfoliation. And the other thing that you can see from this is that exfoliation in uh, ferritic alloys occurs when the oxides are much thicker and have multilaminations, uh, whereas the austenitic alloys are usually single, uh, single layer and uh, much thinner. And we'll, and we'll highlight some of that in a minute. So, so after collecting uh, hundreds of plants worth of data, uh, uh, over probably a period of 30 years, it was it was realized uh, that there were certain patterns of um, of oxide growth on ferritic materials, which uh, which could be used in the investigation if we could sort of introduce some sort of standardization. And this was uh, uh, it. Uh, this was done, and uh, a morphological index for the oxide growth and exfoliation on ferritic, ferritic materials was developed. Um, it, uh, you can see here that it, it includes uh, six, uh, six levels. Uh, I'm not going to go through these in very much detail because they're highlighted on the, on the next few slides, but suffice it to say that these uh, indices go from the initial uh, growth, which is duplex, uh, that means two layers of oxide with no laminations and no hematite all the way through to the situation the situation for level five where you get uh, multi-laminated oxides and, and exfoliation exfoliation taking place and uh, the next uh, few slides i'm just going to give you some uh, examples of of these uh, of these indices Covered in detail in in these uh, in in this paper at the bottom here. So, first of all, for ferritic alloys. So there's two um, two examples of the same thing here. So uh, the oxides that grow initially, you can see the the index will be in yellow like this for each one of the slides. So this is an LG one. So you'll so you'll basically have a, a outer magnetite layer, an inner iron chrome spinel. And this is the alloy here. This is the steam, obviously. And over here, you'll see uh, this uh, duplex uh, growth mechanism. These oxides grow or increase in thickness by uh, iron ions, Fe2 positive ions, uh, diffusing outwards through these oxides and growing oxide on this outside interface. Whereas the uh, O2 minus ion uh, diffuses from the outside from the dissociation of the steam. Uh, down to grow oxide on this particular in interface here, and um, sorry, and um, you'll see in some cases as this oxide gets thicker and thicker, 
this outward movement of iron is reduced, then you'll start to see some hematite on the outside on the outside interface. It's important to note a couple of things here that the growth is uh, is not is not dependent on upon oxygen. Uh, this is not oxygen diffusing through here. This is the oxide iron, and that the, at at this stage, these two layers are approximately of equal thickness, and these diffusion rates are approximately the same. Therefore, there's no stress generated in the in 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 this oxide at, at that time. And these are just these are just schematics. But here is what it actually looks like in in practice. You can see over here. That, um, that this is the steam here, and this is the and this is the metal T22 in this case, and this oxide looks nice and uh, protective at this magnification. If you look at it in detail, you'll you'll see that this layer has uh, the, the oxide consists of two layers: outer magnetite and the inner in, inner iron foam spinel. And um, as uh, uh, with time and uh, uh, what will happen at some stage is that you'll start to initiate uh, another set of duplex oxides at the at the interface. This here is the steel. Is the steel? This is the steam. Here's the uh, the initial magnetite, the initial spinel, and here's the new two layers of oxide growing, starting to grow. And this uh, signifies the change over to uh, to, uh, to um to Oggy, Oggy two. And with and with time, uh, the the number of these uh, uh, these laminations at the at the at the steel oxide interface increase. You can see maybe ten of them here. Uh, here's the original um, original uh, magnetite. Here's the original spinel, and then you get these multi laminations uh, continue. And this continues for some time, um, as you'll see here in this. A specially prepared a sample. You can see the original um, uh, magnetite layer, and now you can see multiple, multiple in, internal layers, uh, alternate layers of magnetite and iron chrome spinel, which grow, which grow and consume the original uh, spinel layer. And this would, would be determined in OB3. And because these oxides, because these uh, laminated oxides always grow at this uh, on the on the tube surface. Um, it, it, it gradually increases the amount of stress that's in the oxide because now it's it's um, growing within a confined uh, within a confined space, and you'll start to see a situation like this, where, whereas here you can start to see now the the cracks which form the due to the stress in the oxide, and uh, uh, the rest is multilaminated here, and here's the magnetite. But you'll also notice now that there's because this oxide is becoming very thick, the iron iron diffusion outwards is restricted, and uh, you'll start to form hematite on the on the outside interface on the outside surface with the steam, and uh, and here is the uh, the final uh, step in OG five, uh, where exfoliation has taken place. So. This is pretty standard for these uh, for these ferritic alloys, but we started to notice some years ago when the T23 alloy was stopped, was introduced into plants that there were some differences to this established picture, and although it looks very like what we've just seen, there are some really key differences. And we need to keep in HRSG uh, in HRSGs uh, a, a good watch, a careful watch on the T23 tubing, because. Uh, because um, the uh, the oxide on T23 exfoliates very quickly and very badly, as you can see, as you can see right here, and as you can see in the next uh, slide right here. So here here is an example of exfoliation taking place in a conventional boiler and in an HRSG. And uh, for those of you that want, would like to know the alloy composition, it's given up here for all for all of these slides. It's just basically a, a, a T22 alloy, but has a little bit of salt and pepper, um, uh, salt and pepper uh, uh, added to the alloy, which changes the growth, which changes the growth mechanism. And this can be seen when we look in detail 
um, add, add, add the oxides that form on these surfaces. And he, so here you can see on, on the left hand side here, you can see the original uh, magnetite and what looks like an iron comb spinel layer. But when you look, uh, when you look in detail, you find that this inner, inner uh, situation consists of um, layers of unequal thickness. Uh, and they're alternating uh, magnetite, which is the light color, and, uh, and spinel, which is the dark color. And uh, because this oxide is becoming very thick, as we saw with the other, or the other situations, we start to get hematite uh, decoration on the outside on the outside interface. And, uh, and this situation here is this, this layered structure um, uh, makes these oxides on the T23 very unique and easily and easily identified. And you can see here when you when we when we do um, an X-ray X-ray uh, image um, of this oxide, you can see very clearly the alternate layers. This is for iron. The lighter colors are, of course, uh, the magnetite, and this is the map for chromium, where the lighter color here are the spinel. Clearly, um, uh, 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 alternate layers of different of different thickness, which make it which make it very unique. There is also there is also some uh, differences to this established picture, of course, for uh, for the P and T ninety one alloy. And uh, and they also um, originally look uh, very similar to what we've seen with the the other ferritic alloys. But when we look in detail, it's a little different. So this is the oxide morphologies on the ninety one alloy in steam. And again, if you look over here, you can see that it looks as if it has an outer layer of magnetite and an inner an inner situation of of spinel. But when we look in detail and we map. Uh, and we map this oxide, you can you can see very clearly that the inner layer now consists of essentially magnetite with uh, chrome rich bands. These are these light bands that are that are in the internal layer within the magnetite. And these, of course, uh, make the oxides that grow on ninety one very uh, a very very unique uh, situation. And uh, we developed uh, a little understanding, mechanistic under, uh, understanding of them. So, as the so here you can see the original magnetite and the original spinel, and uh, we, as the oxidation, uh, as the oxide increases in thickness, the oxidation rate slows down, and these chrome-rich oxide precipitates, which are these uh, blue things, start to form semi-continuous layers, and these become incorporated in into this inner layer, which is what you saw in in the last in the last slide. And there's a couple of important uh, aspects here that as this as the oxide uh, growth slows down, it starts to form voids uh, between the between the oxide layers here, and and at that time you'll start to see the hematite on the outside interface because of the restriction of ion diffusion to uh, to, uh, to this location. And uh, there are a few um, exfoliation uh, processes that take place for 91, but probably the most uh, uh, the, the most common is where we get delamination along this interface here, where these voids uh, uh, join up. And uh, you can see, and you can see it right here on the on the internal surface of a tube. You can see these uh, voids have joined up now to form, uh, sorry, to form. Uh, uh, delamination, uh, uh, and right here, this is uh, algae three and four, just before it exfoliates, and, uh, and this can result in 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 large amounts of ninety one exfoliating, and in some cases has been collected as you as you can see like this. This was in a HRSG header, uh, a large amount of oxide that exfoliated. So these are the unique situations for the ferritic alloys for, for 23 and for 91. And um, I, I just wanted to very quickly go through and talk about the austenitic, the austenitic alloys. Uh, th these are of major importance for fossil, for fossil plants. Um, as, as they uh, result, uh, these flakes of oxide right here uh, block the, uh, the tube bends, as you can see right here, and result in short-term overheating, 
Osinidic aloes are rare in HRSGs, but uh, we've been we've been noticing a few uh, of the manufacturers coming to coming to the HRSG forums talking about using Osinidic aloes in some of the future HRSGs. So so this is just a, a, a little introduction here. You can see that exfoliation takes place. Uh, uh, these examples, of course, are all from uh, from fossil from fossil units, where we get uh, large, very large uh, flakes of oxide that come off and block uh, and block the bends and cause the short term growth. And uh, this just shows a a, uh, a little schematic of how the oxides actually grow. So the major difference between austenitic alloys and fluoritic alloys is that the austenitic alloys only ever grow two layers of sky, two layers like this, an outer layer of magnetite and an inner layer of spinel. And they grow by the same diffusion mechanism where the ionines uh, diffuse outwards and grow on this on the outside interface and the O2 minus uh, ions uh, diffuse inwards and grow on this interface right here. And if you go to this side of the diagram, as the oxide gets uh, thicker and thicker, the, the uh, diffusion path for the iron outwards becomes more difficult. And this gives rise to these voids along the uh, interface between the two oxides. And this increases the deficiency of iron outwards and the hematite uh, amount of hematite increases. And you'll remember, and we talked about the coefficient of expansion, the more of this hematite uh, uh, makes this scale much more, uh, 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 much more likely to exfoliate. So there is a similar uh, morphological index for the oxide growth on austenitic alloys. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through this because you'll see you'll see them on the actual uh, fit of pictures themselves that I'm going to show you. But it, but in this case, for austenitic alloys, we chose letters A, B, C, uh, D, and E on the next slide. And the first one just represents the very initial growth of the uh, duplex uh, duplex oxide um, all the way through to exfoliation uh, here the exfoliation just of the outer layer of the of the magnetite. And then there's a, a further index E here because uh, because uh, the oxide, the magnetite can regrow on the outside, on the outside. So this just shows uh, four uh, sequential pictures. So this is the first one, uh, Augie A, where you see the outer magnetite and inner spinel. And you start to see some voids forming along the interface between the two of them. Uh, no hematite at this stage, but as the as the voids increase along this interface, you start to see some more hematite, which is this lighter color uh, along the surface. And then the next stage will be that the that these voids will join together and form some discontinuities along the uh, along the interface. And at this stage, the hematite on the outside surface is. Is, is much more propense. And then the final stage just before the exfoliation is that this uh, uh, cracking is continuous. And then when it shuts down, it will go into compression and the outer magnetite will, will, ex will exfoliate as shown, as shown in, this, in this slide here. So here you, can see the, uh, here you can see the outer magnetite layer just about to exfoliate. And here you can see uh, for Augie D, is that the outer layer has exfoliated uh, exfoliated completely? The, there are some differences uh, to this uh, uh, to this particular um, uh, situation with the austenitic alloys, but they're really only one of importance is the one for shot peened uh, alloys. Um, and you can see you can see right here. Here's a situation with just the 304 or the 300 series that we've just seen. And this is exfoliated, all the outer magnetite layer has exfoliated here, and just leaving the iron comb spinel. Whereas under the same time and the same magnification of these pictures, you'll see that both the oxide layers are still in place. And it's very, it's very rare, very rare for these super shot, super 304 shot peened alloys to to exfoliate, and the reason for that is because if you look over here at the chromium map, you'll see that there's a chromium-rich layer, 
along uh, all the way along the surface, right, uh, right along the surface of the alloy, um, which actually slows down the rate and uh, prevents the uh, prevents the exfoliation from taking from taking place. So, um, so they were the the databases and the data, and so now I think uh, you, you can probably see um, that. Uh, from the hundreds of uh, from the hundreds of examples uh, that that we have here, it's generally understood uh, that there is no effect of the psychochemistry um, on uh, uh, psychochemistry that's used on the plant, and um, and there's uh, there there are some scientific um, explanations for that. Um, I I don't have time today to go through them, but um, I just did want to mention about uh, the increasing amount of uh, film forming substances that are being added to combined, to combined cycle plants. These are added to try to form a hydrophobic film on the internal surfaces so, so, that, the, so that there will be protection to those surfaces and reducing the amount of iron uh, tra uh, 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 transported. And uh, so we can use these uh, OGI databases uh, also, to identify the deposits and the origin of the oxides, and I'll just cover. I'll just uh, uh. so the major discussion in this area is in this yellow, in these yellow and blue boxes here, is that um, um, how a film forming substance, uh, whether it will form on these surfaces at these temperatures, at six hundred degrees plus. And, uh, and possibly it can only do so during shutdown or condensation phases. And then, you know, can the film exist at, at, at uh, temperatures, uh, at, at these temperatures? And is there in any way in which uh, such a film, if it was possible, would uh, cause a change in the morphology or a change in, in the rate? Well, we haven't seen any changes in the morphology from this, from this database. And uh, and it seems that it would be very, uh, very unusual for uh, such a, a film or such a, a chemical to be able to change the dissociation constant of steam, and, uh, and 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 therefore change the rate and and the morphology, except uh, except during the cooler periods when condensate might be when condensate might be present. So, so. Uh, let me come back to now just to finish uh, a couple of examples um, that I introduced at the beginning here. This was where a steam turbine was essentially uh, losing some performance and there was a lot of deposits on the surface on the surface here as you can see. Um, you can take some you can take some samples uh, and analyze these um, analyze these deposits and uh, then compare it with the database that I just showed you. And here, here's the example. So here's, uh, here, here's some of that oxide that's in the deposit. Uh, it's clearly, uh, it can clearly be identified as, um, as, um, as an oxide that comes from a T23 alloy. And, uh, and at the, um, at the um, index, the OGI index of three and four. So, so this, when you do this, this is very useful for the uh, for the operator that might have deposits in valves, or in this case, on turbines or erosion problems. You can identify exactly where it comes from, and in this particular case, the operator was able to go back and find that there was a problem with the T twenty three in the reheater, and so this was quite a a good a good situation. Final example that I just want to uh, mention. Um, is is of a reheater tube, a series of reheater tube failures. Uh, uh, this was originally presented by uh, Bob and myself and Sergio Gomez from BBE in Spain at the European Forum in Greece in 2019. You can see the the leak uh, right here. Here's a situation where they where they have, where the tube failure was located, and uh, you can see the leak right here. There's a couple of things to note here that are quite important. One is the discoloration of of this uh, of, of these surfaces here, indicating that indicating that the, the temperatures are a little higher than it should be. And the other thing is that there's quite a wide gap between the modules here, allowing the gases 
to pass through uh, 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 pass through here. And uh, so uh, here's the uh, here, here's the situation here where there's been uh, some uh, loss of wall thickness and there's a uh, cracks running all the way along the internal surface here. And, uh, and this is the, so this is where the weld uh, attached it to the header and um, here, here on this side, and you can see this exfoliation, uh, quite severe exfoliation, quite severe oggy uh, on, this, uh, on this side. So this gave us a clue that we might be able to get the information or the, the results that we needed from uh, the Oggy database and the in, and the and the indices, and here is um, it, here are some of the uh, uh, metallographs uh, on the morphology of the oxide. Um, you can see uh, uh, right here; these were taken away from the uh, failure zone, and uh, so this is rather a thick oxide here. But you can but but we could identify this for T22 as being in uh, Oggy three. And even there was some even uh, exfoliation taking place in in the Oggy four uh, 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 category, and so this suggested that the um, that the that the, uh, the the wide gap between the modules was allowing those tubes on either side to overheat. This is where the current failure was, but there had also been a previous failure where there was a gap between the between the sidewall. And this um, increased the uh, increase the temperature, increased the oxidation rate, increased the uh, the Oggy index, and this allowed the oxide to uh, to spall or exfoliate. And uh, the the suggestion is is that the oxide fell down here and caused uh, some uh, partial blocking and increase in temperature of the uh, of the tube, resulting in the uh, resulting in the failure. And uh, so, so there they, they were the examples. I just want to finish here now um, uh, and summarize. I think uh, a few key a few key uh, features. So you've seen that there's an established morphological picture uh, and indices for Oggy on normal ferritic and austenitic alloys. It's slightly different for T twenty three and T ninety one. And very different for fine grain and shot peen bosonidics, but these make these uh, unique. And uh, so, if there's any damage in the plant or collection of uh, oxide, we can identify exactly where it uh, exactly where it comes from, as, as I showed you. There's no effect of psychochemistry on uh, on on uh, algae, and there is uh, currently, um, but there is currently some uncertainty. On, on exactly what an FFS film forming substance can do in a, in a steam circuit. The time and operating regimes of exfoliation are known. Uh, and it's, it's quite well understood now that they, those very thick laminated oxides on the lower chrome ferritics can lead to solid particle erosion in the turbine. And uh, the oxides on the austenitic materials can lead to short term overheating. This is in conventional plants at the moment. Uh, the oxides on T91 can result in either long-term overheating or short-term overheating, depending on the oxide morphology. And uh, we can identify uh, deposits and erosion damage by looking at by by, by looking at the uh, oxide. So so that's um, so that's the end of this presentation. But I did I, I don't want to go don't need to go through it, but I did want to just mention that. Um, that uh, in the in the forty minutes here, I've given you a quick uh, tour of of Augie, uh, and there were a lot of people that were involved in in um, in 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 this work over over the years, all the way back from the late nineteen sixties. Uh, originally, uh, with John Stringer, who uh, who introduced the uh, the importance of oxide morphologies at the University of Liverpool and the Oxide Group. And then for 25 years, when I uh, worked with him at uh, at Epri, one of my colleagues, Jim Westwood at Ontario Hydro, he and I produced the first uh, compilation of Oggy uh, back in pub. It was published by the Canadian Electrical Association in '83. I showed you some of the work that Steve Patterson and I did, where we tried to uh, 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 encom encompass the results from from, from hundreds of uh, plants and 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 materials that we'd looked at 
in, in into the into the stress and strain areas in in this sort of time period. Ian Wright, my my good colleague, uh, uh, started started the work when he was working with me on on his FPRI sabbatical, and uh, then uh, for many years in the Oxide Group at at Oak Ridge National Lab. He's now retired, but he's the co-author with me of the three uh, Oggy papers that were referenced. And Wendy and Wendy Weiss, uh, who's uh, who was one of the metallurgists at uh, at SI, conducted the Oggy metallography over the last ten years at uh, at SI. And there was hundreds, of course, of operators and utilities worldwide who have unfortunately shared their failures and damage. So. So Scott and Bob, if you're there, uh, 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 that's the end of the little tour here for for um, for Oggy. And uh, is that is that okay? Is there anybody anybody yeah. still there? Yeah, it's, it's fine, Barry. Uh, we have a, uh, a question or two. Um, okay. First question Thanks. is from. Just a moment. The first question is from. Uh, to find it. Oh, we have a lot of questions all of a sudden. Wow. Okay, okay. good. <laughs> just, so the first not... question is from Edward Speck Kern with Florida Power and Light. Um, Scott, can you uh, unmute Edward? I'm just trying to get my my camera on here. How, how do I get my camera on? Yeah, this is Edward. Hey, thank you. Uh, I was just curious if uh, UT can be effective or how effective is it in understanding the voids and cracking as the uh, OGE progresses? Ed, in, in terms of what, sorry? As just detecting the different levels of um, oxide generation and exfoliation or where one might be in the process? I mean, can it be detected at all with UT or, you know, can you no. see where you are? Oh, in I see the, it. Okay. The so all, all, all the, all the, all the work that I, um, all the work that I showed you Ed, was all done by, uh, from tubes that were removed um, and conducted uh, metallography in the, in, in the laboratory. Of course, you can measure the thickness um, measure the thickness of them, but all the intricate detail of the uh, void formation and laminations and all of those were done uh, were done uh, by metallography. Okay, the next question is from uh, Pavel. Pavel, and I'm going to ruin his last name. So, uh, Scott, if you'll <laughs> unmute Pavel, he can tell us. Correctly, what his last name is, and ask his question. Yeah, it's Chikotovich. It rolls right off the tongue there. Uh, uh, yeah, I was just uh, curious. Just uh, like it's just like it's spelled. Good. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just curious, what modes of Herzig operations drive the most stresses uh, that produce the exfoliation? Particularly, is it a startup, shutdown, trip? And what ways can you mitigate this? Is it can you modify ramp rates, uh, verify that you're not uh, over attemperating such things like that? So, um, uh, it's it's well understood, and I covered it, but I covered a lot of things in in that in that the key uh, driver for the exfoliation event, wherever it is, it, is that difference between the the coefficient of thermal expansion, and it was it was it was actually on that slide, uh, but I didn't even, I didn't mention it. It's it's actually the delta that the that the tube and the oxide go through, and and generally not the rate of change. So uh, what 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 we find is is that um, is that the exfoliation event is dependent upon the delta. So I, I gave you some examples from 600 degrees down to room temperature. And uh, it, it has to go through that delta to co to cause the oxide to exfoliate. Okay. Uh, next oh, oh. Is, is Ken Couric. Um, 
Ben Kurek, yes, I know him. Yeah. Ah. Hey, Barry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfect. Okay, my question was, how can uh, you determine if the presence of the hematite on the metal surface is due to just a normal passivation or if it's present due to exfoliation? Uh, well, um, I, I try to ex again. I try to explain. I try to explain how it how it forms. Uh, there's been uh, some confusion that the, uh, for many years, all, all the way back to the 60s, that 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 that, that he, the presence of the hematite on the outside surface was in some way due to the oxidizing power within the steam. But now, but now that's been shown uh, 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 not to be correct, and the and the hematite uh, forms because because the outward movement of the iron ions is restricted, and as uh, 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 as you know, uh, if if that happens, a lower the lower iron will will produce that uh, will will produce that uh, hematite. And uh, you saw in a number of the progressions that I that I indicated that, that that's exactly what happens. You don't get you don't get that formation of the hematite initially, uh, and you don't get it un you don't get it until the oxide reaches some uh, say critical thickness where where the iron diffusion is is reduced. Okay, and it's not uh, and uh, you, you, I think you can use a slightly incorrect terminology it's not meant to be a, a, a passive layer you're talking about steam here you're not talking about feed water where the where the red uh, hematite is 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 provides some protection okay scott the next uh next question is your fame kashir you can unmute uh your fame Yeah, uh, but I was wondering if there is an analytical relationship between uh, um, rows of oxide and uh, exfoliation and number of starts and cycle and operations so we can predict uh, uh, when we're going to start having problems with uh, with the start and cycle and operation. Yeah, Sam, it's a, it's a very common it's a very common question uh, nearly all all the way from the beginning of um, of um, of Augie, um, and uh, but there's never been any relationship um, developed to say to relate the number of starts with the number of uh, with the number of um, uh, laminations. You know, I, I showed you many cases where the oxides don't even don't even go into lamination, uh, but but those you but those units from the database have had. In some cases, an enormous number of uh, uh, startup cycles. So, uh, at, at at the moment, uh, and I think it's it's reasonably um, uh, reasonably concrete, is that there hasn't been that uh, relationship developed uh, in in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Yefem. Uh, Barry, there's a question from uh, Bob Schwieger who doesn't have a microphone, so I'll read it. Um, Bob, Bob Schmiga, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Are there different rates of oxide formation among the different producers of P or T91? And if so, what should users look for in a material specification to get the best uh, material? Yes. Well, the simple the simple answer is, the simple answer for Bob is, is yes. And when you're talking about oxidation of these alloys, particularly uh, 91, that relates to uh, uh, to the chromium content, uh, or simply to the chromium content. But of course, um, as these as these alloys, as I mentioned, are semiconductors, and they grow and they increase their rate or decrease their rate um, by the uh, change in the in in in, in the uh, semiconductor nature of that diffusion process. So, so those small alloy additions, such as vanadium and and, and tungsten, and those change the uh, 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 have the ability 
um, th through that uh, through that semiconductor process to actually uh, to actually change the um, uh, to change the process and and you know of course the the uh, the the composition um, of the um, of the alloy uh, and the specification therein is more dependent upon the mechanical properties of 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 those um, of those elements as well. Okay, we have just a few more minutes, and we have a couple of raised hands. Uh, uh, Scott, can you unmute Yogesh Patel with Tico? He... Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can yes. hear. Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dooley and Mr. Anderson. Good to see you guys and and the whole team. Um, a good coverage. Um, particularly question that I have with respect to the industry trend, and that is a lot of utilities and some IPPs are going for GTAP operation, which is gas termine optimization, which increases the firing temperature a little bit, and as, at the same time, mainly it increases the gas flow. And along with that, particularly for low loads, the sprays are high. So my question is, Looking at the data that you presented, um, again, that was the unit in Spain for the reheater tube failure. Uh, my question is, uh, in that case, I remember that the temperature rise was not significantly high. It was by four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and now that we are going for GTOP operation, the two metal temperatures would increase because of the higher mass flows and also the buildup of uh, scale inside in terms of protecting layer because of the higher steam flow that also will be impacted. So my question is any information you share on um, this GTAP operation? Have you seen from the industry any early failures or exfoliation? Um, and if it is, uh, what to watch for? Yeah, Yogesh, um, um, I'll, I'll have to de I'll have to defer to Bob. I, I, I can't make any comment about GTOP or the the other the other uh, uh, items, but um, you'll see uh, from an oxidation point of view, you'll see in the um, in the paper that I referenced that there is a table that there is a table in there, and it's a table of what we call oxidation limits, and uh, we've derived that o over the years. Um, so, so to minimize the um, uh, the in the increase of oxidation that would steam grown oxidation that would that would take place, and uh, and there is there is an oxidation limit for each one of the materials for T twenty two for T ninety one for osinitics etc that you don't that you don't want to exceed. And um, I, I, again, I can't make any comment about the GTOP, but, but at our EA, at, at our European forum, we've had uh, similar uh, discussions about the temperature of operation and what those and what those alloys would be in terms of in terms of uh, going to osinitic alloys and particularly the uh, and particularly the uh, the shot peened alloys to overcome to overcome. The, the the possibility of the metal uh, tube metal temperature exceeding that oxidation limit. So, Bob, have you got anything to say on the? Uh, uh, no, other than other than uh, it, wouldn't it be true that if the exhaust temperature runs consistently somewhat higher than it previously did before the modification, that you would expect uh, uh, oxide growth rate to increase? Uh, yes, uh, yes, absolutely, and you know one of the things we always say, and nobody, and nobody, of course, likes to hear it, is that it it might it might be a good idea to remove some of the final superheater or final reheater temperatures uh, uh, tubing if if you do that, because then you can categorize exactly where that oxide is in in that index spectrum. Um, you you mean remove it, remove remove it as a sample. Not to remove it to, yeah, to change correct. the performance. Yeah, correct, correct. Good. But nobody, but 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 nobody ever likes to do that, of course. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, 
if the, that is true and at the same time with the degradation of material in terms of creep damage also you don't have the same properties anymore <laughs> so that would also okay. help yeah. yeah correct yeah thanks okay well thank you thanks, thank sir. you barry we've we've uh well we have one, we have, um, one more at the expense of being a minute late on the next one, we have uh, one more question from uh, Sam Shelvan. Can you unmute Sam, please? Oh, hello. Here. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, my question is, I have a tube sample that went through the metallographic analysis, and that shows a lot of pitting that's in, 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 uh, near the crack location, in addition to the, um, the oxide scales. Um, and the temperature they were operating was 540 degrees C, the metal temperature measured, and the uh, oxygen level in that steam was around 300 ppb. My question is, what causes that pitting down into the base metal? I, I understand that you I explained the void formation between the phenyl and the magnetite layer and, and the exchange of iron, but the pitting occurred right into the base metal. Is this uh, uh, the O2 migrating into the uh, deposit, under deposit corrosion kind of thing happening there? Or what is the explanation for that pitting? Well, uh, uh, Sam, I don't think that's possible to to uh, to answer. Uh, you know, in a situation like this, if you send me, if you send it to me, I'll interpret. You know, where is the pitting? Is it just in the metal below the below the oxide in sort of an internal oxidation zone? Because in some of these alloys, we have what's called an internal oxidation zone, and and sometimes we we see things that look like pits. But if, but if the pits that you're describing actually go through the wall of the uh, of the material, then 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 that would usually be related related in some way to inappropriate shutdown conditions on the unit. Uh, but but it would but without any without any uh, more information, it'd be difficult to uh, answer that. Okay, thank you. I will send that uh, privately to you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, just send it. Okay. Bye. Okay. We have we have one last question. I'll sneak in. Um, oh. <laughs> and I, even Barry, even I know the answer to this one. Um, question oh. is from from Doug Ryan. Uh, so, so you know it's a simple question if I can answer it right. Since hematite uh, since hematite formation is caused by increased thickness of corrosion layers, which reduce the migration of the iron ions. So how can you reduce the rate of growth of the spinel? And magnetite layers, and I'm going to take a flyer that the answer is you've got to reduce the operating temperature of the tube. Yes. Uh, well, obviously, uh, 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 obviously, um, as the as the as it's a counterflux diffusion mechanism that that causes those duplex oxides to grow. If the outward movement of iron is reduced, the inward the inward movement of the O2 minus iron is reduced, reducing the oxide growth at the uh, at the uh, uh, on the internal interface as well. Yeah. So did you just say the same thing I did? I'm not sure about that, Bob. Big part. I said I'm not sure about that. We'll, we'll say oh. we'll say yes. Okay. All right, Barry, thank you very much.